Welcome everybody to the conference and uh, the first speaker we have is Dr. Mark Villinger from the ETH uh, in Zurich, Switzerland. Obviously Mark is a, a very familiar face because not only did he work for many years here in Aveiro but also continues collaboration with Aveiro and is also a regular participant in this conference. Um, it's actually a, a great pleasure to uh, present Mark. Not only am I a good friend of his, but also uh, actually he's truly an expert in what he does and uh, always makes a great presentation and we always uh, learn a lot uh, from his presentations. So uh, it's truly excellent. Um, let me give you a little bit about his background. He did his PhD in physics in uh, the Technical University of Vienna, uh, followed by a postdoc in the um, Fitz Harbour Institute of the Max Planck Society in Berlin. Uh, that was before doing a, a highlight of his career of being an investigator in Aveiro for, for four years. <laughs> and, and then he went to be a, a group leader in the Fitz Harbour Institute of Berlin. Um, <coughs> Uh, and in 2015, he started a second group, uh, electron microscopy group at the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces, before his current job, which he's now been doing since um, 2018, being the leader of the in the Scientific Center of Optical and Electron uh, Microscopy at the ETH in Zurich. Uh, Mark's speciality is uh, in situ methods to, to study um, structural property relationships and uh, his talk today uh, is exactly on that. It's on the growth and coalescence behavior of graphene insights from in situ scanning electron microscopy. So a big welcome to Mark. Great to see you here. Thank you Duncan. Thank you very much. I will try to share my screen. You see something? Okay and you can hear me. So yeah uh, that's that's the story. Yeah. I I have been in Aveiro, which was a lucky coincidence. A friend of mine, Nicola Pinna, actually convinced me to go there. I was happy in Berlin; everything was good. I was postdoc, and then I visited him, and I was at the beach in Barra, Praia de Barra. I saw the ocean, and I thought, "My God, I could really live here." And then I decided to go to Aveiro, and and these four years in Aveiro, I will never forget them. They just they were, this was such an impression on me, and I have lots of good friends. And I'm very, very grateful that I still can have such a nice uh, contact with all of you. And, and that's also why I like to participate in this conference. And I would have loved to come, but due to Corona, this is not possible. Um, yeah, this, this presentation is about in situ observation of graphene growth. So, so I'm a very visual person. I, you know, we do lots of, of spectroscopy. We do lots of things that are a bit indirect, but I love to see things as they're happening. And so that somehow I, maybe because I'm doing electron microscopy, but at one point I, I started to go away from just imaging static objects in vacuum. And I wanted to do stuff like, you know, when, when something is going on, something is happening. And so I went into this in situ field. And, and today I will speak a bit about uh, our work on, on graphene growth. So, um, and, and, and to study how graphene grows, we use the scanning electron microscope. So you have a vacuum chamber at the bottom of a, the chamber of a scanning electron microscope. And there are different types of scanning electron microscopes. Some allow you to introduce gases into the chamber so you don't work in a full vacuum. And, and we had such an instrument in Berlin and most of the results that I show you have been obtained with this uh, Thermo Fischer or at that time FEI a quantum SEM, it's an environmental SEM. And in Berlin, we have equipped that instrument with, with a, a number of, of, of gas uh, flow meters. So we could precisely dose different types of gases directly into the chamber. And then we, we had a heating stage, the commercial heat, heating stages, they're fine. But if you do reactions in, in, in reactive atmospheres, these this normal conventional heating stages, they usually suffer because the heating stage has a hot wire. And when you do experiments in, in, in crazy gases, then these, these heating stages, they actually also die this time. So we, we built basically our own heating stage that works with a laser. So we use a laser heating to heat up the sample from below. So that the light comes from below, heats the sample, and we observe with the secondary electron, with a scanning electron microscope from, from the top. Uh, please at any time, you know, that I'm, I'm just talking to a computer screen and I feel a bit lost. 
So at any time you have a question, just pop in, ask a question and show that you're alive. Yeah? Okay, anyhow, so this is the instrument that we use and it's really cool because it can be operated first of all, of course, in high vacuum mode, but then you can introduce gases into different uh, operating modes where the pumping system is slightly different, differently configured. And you can, you can work in a quite large range of, of uh, pressures in a collaboration with a group from Graz, we were actually even once doing an experiment at one bar. So we could, you know, you can really go up to very high pressures inside that microscope and still get some images. And yeah, so this is the instrument that we have used. It's a really, really very versatile instrument. So we don't only do 2D film growth like is shown here, but we also do some nanowires and we, we look at, at, at corrosions and, uh, and oxidation of, of, of electrodes and, and, and surfaces and metals. We do a lot of uh, catalysis studies so where we look really at how does a catalyst, model catalyst look like. And, and, and in the conference that starts tomorrow, I will, I will speak a bit about this catalysis field. And you can also do experiments in liquids when you have some, some like beam transparent cells and so on. So that's, that's really a very versatile tool and, and I really want to advertise it. When you think about in situ electron microscopy, most people at conferences, they talk about in situ transmission electron microscopy. I mean, these, these are huge, very expensive instruments where you can do things at very high resolution. And, and people often forget that the simple scanning electron microscope is actually a very nice in situ platform yeah, if you want to do in situ electron microscopy. So um, yes, today's talk on this 2D workshop is, is um, the growth of graphene. So there was this huge hype after the Nobel Prize was awarded for the graphene and, and people tried to grow graphene then you know the peeling peeling with, with a tape with a gluing tape is a bit tedious so one one way to get graphene is to grow it by chemical vapor dep deposition so CVD growth and what you do there is you have a metal substrate that can be most often it's copper but you can try nickel iridium rhodium Ruthenium, different metals work. And what you do, you heat up that metal substrate to quite high temperatures, like 900,000 degrees. And then you introduce a, a carbon source, it's a hydrocarbon. All the experiments that I showed today were made with ethylene. And you also introduce hydrogen. So you have a gas mixture of hydrogen and ethylene in a very, yeah, in a very hot uh, substrate. And then, yeah, somehow graphene grows because this, this, this hydrocarbon will molecule it decomposes and then you form carbon and then because of hydrogen actually carbon can also be etched away so any carbon that is just like loosely arranged will be etched away and only the carbon that forms beautiful stable graphene that keeps growing so that's the idea behind it and what people normally do is they have a quartz furnace that they put in an oven so it's a quartz tube inside an oven they put a sample inside they flow first maybe purge everything with argon then they do a annealing step to get the surface clean. And then at one point you start growing by putting the hydrocarbon, the hydrogen together into that thing. And then after growth, you cool everything down and post growth, after growth, you, you look at what you have obtained. And, and what you then do is you see, okay, that growth was good or not good. And then you change some parameters, maybe the growth time and the pressure, temperature, whatever. And then you do it again. It's, it's usually always very tedious to optimize growth conditions because you only see afterwards what you have obtained. And the idea was with SCM to directly look at it. And, and it was ex actually Stefan Hoffmann from Cambridge who asked me, uh, Mark, can we grow graphene inside the SCM? And, and I, was saying, I was saying, no, I don't think it's possible because graphene is a monolayer. And everyone who knows about how an SCM works, you know that your surface sensitive, but I mean, would you really be able to see a monolayer at 1000 degrees on a metal surface? So I, I first really doubt that that this would be possible. But actually it is possible and I will show you how that it is possible in this presentation. And, and I start with copper. So the copper is that, that substrate that most people use. And we go through all the steps. So you put a substrate into the growth chamber, in, in this case into the microscope. And the first thing you need to do is to, to clean the surface. And, and we do that by cleaning at high temperature in hydrogen. So I will show you first that video. And then afterwards we will look at how the graphene grows. And then we will have to cool down the substrate and we look at what happens when we cool down the substrate. So first thing, the foils that we buy usually are polycrystalline copper foils of very high purity, so 99.99% or even 999% pure copper. And, and many people yeah, buy high purity copper, 
And the foil looks at the beginning like this. You see that this, this surface structure from the rolling process. And when you look at literature, what people obtain, so the, what I show on the right side here, is a picture from a publication. And what people obtain is, is they have a surface then with some graphene flakes. This is just one random example. And in this particular example, you see that there's graphene flakes, but there are lots of like contaminations here on the surface. I hope you see my mouse pointer. That is white particles. But there's always some kind of an issue. The question is, what are these white particles? Where are they coming from? Is this foil not clean enough? And so on. And we will learn all of this by just seeing what happens. So let's, let's go through it. So I start with such a foil. We put that into our microscope. This was at the big, very beginning where we were still using the co commercial crucible to heat the sample. So this is basically the bottom, the, the, the top part of the crucible with our cup of foil mounted here. Uh, what you see here is our attempts to spot weld a thermocouple. So what we normally do is we measure the temperature directly by spot welding a K-type thermocouple onto that copper foil. And copper is a good conductor, so spot welding on copper is not, not very trivial. So you see that we burned some holes. But anyway, so we measure the temperature of so a K-type thermocouple. This is the sample on the crucible. What you see here on the bottom, that's the gas inlet. So from here we dose hydrogen and later when we start growing acetylene hydrogen mixtures. Okay, so now I go to the video. We zoom in a bit. You see the stripes from the rolling process. Maybe a pause here. You see the, the stripes. Then you see some contrast due to you know, the polycrystalline folds. You have different grains. When the video is running somewhere down here, you see the temperature at the moment. We're at 485 degrees C. So I let this video run now. The temperature goes up. And at a certain temperature, you start to see that the grain boundaries start to get mobile. So there's like some grain growth. Now we're at 700 degrees. And now suddenly you see maybe a pause here. You see that there are lots of these white particles already on the surface. So this is really migration of impurities to the surface. And meanwhile, we know that these impurities are silica. Yes, so silicium somehow inside the bulk of the copper foil segregates to the surface and somehow it finds oxygen and then you have these silica particles. They're the same particles as these ones. So continue, we are now at 700 something degrees, we go higher. Actually the surface has also, uh, you see some, some surface steps here, it's, it's very funny, there are some morphological changes. We go even higher, you see grains moving and stuff. And now uh, we are at 912 degrees. And what you see now is that the surface it's very, very dynamic. You see these particles, these, these silica particles, they come, come even more to the surface, they aggregate. And, and it seems like there's a film on the surface in which these particles are moving. And these aggregates of the silica particles, they are really disturbing later the growth. So what we did often is that we did annealing, then we cooled down everything. We cleaned the surface to get rid of these particles and with a second annealing process and so on. So these particles are really disturbing growth. And what is important here is the observation that at around 950 degrees and 940 degrees, the surface acts very dynamic. And we were surprised about that, but only until I looked into the literature. And you can see in this paper from, from 1978, before a bulk material melts, there's the effect of surface pre-melting. And so depending on the surface that you're looking at, if you have a one 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 surface, it's a closed packed surface, the pre-melting that is happening before the real bulk melting temperature is relatively high, but on some open surfaces like the one one zero, the pre-melting can actually start quite low. So the observation is that whatever you do, when you grow graphene on copper at very high temperatures, the topmost layer is already quasi-liquid. Yeah? So you have a pre-melting. So the graphene actually grows not on a static fixed copper surface, but on something that is already quite dynamic. And um, this, is, this is good to know because people have, of course, tried to understand how graphene grows. So you have a hydrocarbon, this decomposes, you have the carbon atoms, and then you, how do you form the first seed? How do they attach? So they use some kind of TFT calculations. Anyhow, that's a zero Kelvin ground state calculations. Maybe they could take into account some temperature effects. But anyhow, they, they, they did simulations for rigid structures. And, and then in the end, when you do observations of graphene, there were lots of contradictory results. So people have seen on different grains, different growth behavior, and so on. And, and it's difficult to put all these different results together. 
when you don't actually know how the surface looks like under gross conditions. And from our videos we have seen, it's actually quite dynamic, it's pre-melted, maybe not rigidly structured, so these models are questionable. Yeah? And, and indeed later, or actually, yeah, this was even before us, <laughs> not later, but people have also shown that you can beautifully grow graphene on liquid copper. Yeah? So they, they melted copper to a point it was liquid, it forms nice little droplets, and there are beautiful videos on YouTube and in literature where you see how graphene islands really grow and swim on the surface of a melted copper, and then they can nicely assemble and so on. We did that as well, but in our microscope this was horrible, because when you go to such high temperatures, the copper sublimates, and everything was coated with copper, so we didn't do that systematically, we just tried it once. I know, so at high temperature, the surface is pre-melted and you had lots of issues with these contaminating silica particles that come to the surface. But now let's, let's switch from the annealing in hydrogen to the growth conditions. And uh, yeah, let me just pause this video a bit. So when, when this video starts, you see here already the nucleation has started. You see uh, here is a different grain. So there are different grains. It's a polycrystalline foil. You see grain boundaries. You see this, uh, we have cleaned this sample a bit and, and did a second uh, heating step, but there are still these silica particles on the surface. And uh, we are at 1000 degrees. You see here the temperature 1003 degrees. We are at a relatively low pressure. So yeah, 10 to the minus two Pascal. And we have ethylene diluted with hydrogen. So a lot of hydrogen, just a bit of ethylene. Maybe I should run the video manually. So you see at some point some uh, nucleations, I mean actually the, the actual nucleation we don't see, but you see the, 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 as, as the nucleus reach a critical size, they manage to grow. And we see when they start growing at a certain size, we can see them. And then um, yeah, some, some of them are beautifully hexagonally shaped. So let's just look at this guy, for example, this guy. And yeah, let the video run now. And you see they grow and grow and grow and grow. While they are growing, as I said before, the surface is still dynamic. You see that there are some grain boundaries on the right side. You see this grain boundary is still slipping. That means that uh, the surface is pre-melted and underneath in the bulk, there are lots, lots of rearrangements. That's how grains grow. They take over the order of another grain. And you see how they are growing. And actually, you know, I have looked at this video about a million times. You see that uh, uh, maybe when I move back and forth, you can see that these white silica particles, they're also diffusing in the surface. It's another indication that the surface is really pre-melted. And what you maybe also can see is that the surface at the beginning, let's say when the growth starts here, is relatively smooth, but with time you get some kind of a hill and valley formation. You see, you see there's some, uh, let me go back to that point. There are some features like the surface has a, yeah, some hill and valley formation. So that's quite interesting what's going on here. And uh, let's look at first the growth. So we have the pictures, so we can look at the evolution of growth and we take the snapshots and we can then look at the, how does the outline change and we can superimpose all of this and we can of course then analyze the growth speed. And, and we, we basically see that the growth um, yeah, let's, let's just look at this guy. We see how the, 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 the coverage or the area grows. So at the beginning, it grows really like a square function. And then at one point, it reaches like a kind of a saturation. It's like a logistic curve. And we also see that at the beginning, there are lots of nucleation events. But with time, the number of nuclei really drops. And then at the, at the end, there is no more new nucleation event happening. And then, so we have, we can analyze the growth speed and we can model that a bit. We actually see that in the, in the very end, when the, when the growth basically stops, we actually start to see competition between growth and etching. So this thing, this thing, the boundaries are still changing a bit. There's sometimes growth, there's a bit etching. So we reach a kind of equilibrium because we're still feeding ethylene, we're still feeding hydrogen. And as the catalyst, and the copper is our substrate, is our catalyst. As the catalyst gets more and more and more covered with graphene, there's less and less and less free catalyst surface available to make growth species. So at one point, at the given chemical potential of the gas phase, so when we have a certain concentration of ethylene in the gas phase, as soon as the catalyst reaches a certain coverage, growth stops because at that point etching and growth is balanced.
And we can see that this is very funny. So when we look at different grains of graphene, we looked at some guys that had lots of other graphene grains in their surrounding. And we could see guys that had other gra graphene islands in, nearby, they didn't grow as fast, they were growing slower. They were also growing fast when everything was far apart, but when the graphene grow, uh, uh, flakes grow larger, and the free catalyst surface area gets smaller, and nearby guys, they're also feeding on growth species. And when they're getting close, they're starting to compete for growth species and then they, they actually stop growing. So that's also the reason why nearby flakes, they, 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 they don't want to grow together because they're feeding on growth species. There's a kind of a growth competition. And all these nice things you can see and study in detail. So you see here, this is just a simple hand-drawn model. You have this nucleation, events and they start to grow. There are some growth species made by the copper because it's catalytically active and helps to dissociate the hydrocarbon. And then these nuclei, they, they are feeding. So there's a growth front in which there's a kind of a depletion layer because carbon species get attached to the growing graphene island. And, and then growth is nice, yeah, it's just a basic attachment limit. They just, carbon gets built into the structure, it grows. The radial speed is constant. And when the radial speed is constant, then the area is a square function, right? That's this area where the area, is, uh, the area grows as a square function because the radius goes linear and then the area goes square, pi r squared. So you have the square function. And then at one point, this, this, this uh, depleting layer, the, where the feeding layer the, at the growth front, when the neighbors start to overlap, that's around here, there's competition for growth species. And, and then grows really, really slows down. And in addition, more and more of the surface of the catalyst gets covered, which is not good. And then grows further, stops down, slows down until growth and etching, because you have hydrogen all the time, is in balance and then growth stops. So you can then do a trick. You can just increase the pressure. And we did that. So you can increase the pressure. You have more ethylene in the atmosphere, then you can actually reinitiate growth. But it's very difficult in copper to get a continuous film. People manage it now because they mix copper, for example, with nickel. Nickel is, you know, it's also catalytically active. You couple nickel alloys and then you can nicely grow. And also people have done some tricks where they have a substrate on which they want to grow and they just wrap a copper foil around. So you have a lot of copper in the surrounding and you make growth species somewhere else. And what also is, is interesting is in our case, only the substrate is hot and in the surrounding everything is cold. So we only make growth species on the hot substrate. Some people, when they use a furnace, the walls are hot, even hotter than the catalyst itself because the heat from outside. And then if a hot wall grows conditions, and then actually at the hot wall, you can also make growth species that rain down on the surface. And, and that, that is a very complex chemistry. I don't know who of you is growing graphene, but people that grow graphene in a quartz tube, they grow a few times at one position, then they change the position because the quartz tube gets coated with sublimated copper. There's a lot of crazy chemistry. Anyhow, in our case, we have only the substrate, cold walls around, we only have the catalyst that is hot, and graphene growth is self-limiting because the catalyst gets more and more covered, and etching and growth at one point gets into a balance, and then there's no more growth. Yeah? So we have looked at this in all kinds of details. Yeah, as I said before, we, we correlated the growth speed as a number of, of neighbors, and we saw more neighbors, smaller growth speed, you see this here. There's a guy that has not many neighbors, grows nicely fast, but it's always this logistic curve-like growth. And the guy that has like many neighbors, he cannot grow very far because other guys are also harvesting growth species at the growth front. Yeah? So you have grown, and now of course you need to cool down. Yeah? In the end, you want to take the graphene out of the oven and move it, remove it from the substrate. And what people usually don't see is what happens during cooling. And there's a lot of things happen. Let's have a look. We cool down. So I, I again do slow down. Oops, I'm sorry. I slow down the video a bit with my, I do the slider by myself. So this is the same video as before, just a slightly different position. You have these graphene islands. We are at the moment at like 750 degrees, 700, yeah, something like this, and which is cooling down. And as you see at one point, I don't know if you can see it, there's some contrast change, the imaging was not perfect. But just look at, look at if you can see that the surface starts to form steps. So during cooling, in the ranges, so the dark patches, that's the graphene. And you see during cooling, they're stepping at the surface. So the surface forms steps during cooling. 
It's smooth at the beginning and during cooling, we form lots of, lots of, lots of reconstructions. And that's what you have in the end. So you cool down and you go through this strange phase where the surface underneath the graphene starts to facet. So here's a, a, a few snapshots from that video. We cool down and it somehow just around 700 degrees, the surface starts to reconstruct. And that's not just because we do that thing in the environmental SEM, other people, and if you go through publications, you see that a lot, that the graphene covered area shows some reconstruction. If people cool down in an atmosphere that has a lot of oxygen, the uncovered cup performs very clearly a surface oxide layer and the covered graphene forms reconstructions. Yeah? And I mean, you can just, I guess you're all experts in 2D films, so you know that. And there are lots of papers where these reconstructions were investigated and people try to correlate the different facets with growth. But we know undergrowth, the surface is quasi melted and these steps actually form during cooling. But why do they form? What is going on here? Now, meanwhile, we know much more than we knew then. And I can tell you these are oxygen induced surface reconstructions. The point is when we grow graphene, we grow that in the chamber and the oxygen partial pressure is never zero. It's an SEM that has rubber ceilings. It's not a UHV chamber. And actually I heard people say that in a UHV chamber, that is really perfect vacuum, with just ethylene and hydrogen, you cannot grow graphene. And my former boss, Robert Schlögel, he's a catalyst person, a chemist. I'm a physicist, so I don't know such things. But he said, Mark, in a film, in a, in a liquid layer of just copper atoms, it's a sea of electrons. What should decompose catalytically an ethylene, a hydrocarbon? There must be some species of oxygen in there. And indeed, I believe as well that there must be some oxygen in there. But if you have too much oxygen during cooling, the oxygen induces surface reconstructions. Yeah? So there's a, big, there's a very careful balance in, in, in oxygen-induced reconstruction. You don't want to have oxide formation. And so, but the oxygen, I blame the oxygen for these reconstructions. And uh, yeah, here's my student at that time was very, very patient. So he, he looked at these reconstructions and he saw, for example, nice traces. He did some like AFM and stuff. But he, he looked at, at, for example, at these silica particles that form like etching traces. So there is some, some kind of graphene etching happening. That is also happening because there's oxygen somewhere around. This is also again from, from literature. You see there other people observe the same with silica particles. They can etch traces into the, into the graphene. So there's some dynamics during cooling, during growth. There's always a bit of oxygen also involved. I think it's needed for growth at very, 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 very high dilution. And this oxygen is also responsible for cooling. And when we look a bit, we see that these reconstructions during cooling, they of course depend on the grain orientation. So we have a polycrystalline copper foil where the copper atoms are differently packed, yeah, and a one, 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 it's a quite stable surface. We don't have so much reconstructions. It, it, we have some, but it's relatively flat. On some other grains, there is huge reconstructions. And what I uh, forgot to mention before is you see here very clearly this hill and valley formation. That is the consequence of uh, sublimation. So the, the copper at very, very high temperature is sublimating a lot. It's just like vaporizing, so solid to vapor. And when you grow graphene, you have a, it's like an umbrella, but inverse umbrella. So the graphene sits on the copper and prevents sublimation. Between graphene islands, there's still free copper, it sublimates. So actually, the, the surface level of the copper due to sublimation goes downwards and the graphene in the end forms hills. Yeah, so this hill and valley formation is a consequence of sublimation. And on this grain, the sublimation was larger than on that grain. The reconstruction was also larger. And um, okay, this is just a slide to show that we really have graphene. This is our graphene, literature graphene with the Raman and, and we did STM, which is beautiful graphene. But let's come down to these reconstructions. When you look at the phase diagram of copper, and you see the copper, copper oxide, and so on. And we know, sorry, that was too fast. We know that when we cool down, at the partial pressures of oxygen we have in our chamber. It's not much and you don't need much. When you cool down from a high temperature where you have liquid molten copper on the surface, you grow graphene. When you cool down at our partial pressures at around 700 degrees, somewhere down there, uh, even down there, that's where we are, you run into a copper oxide that gets stable. And even before you make copper oxide, you can actually get oxygen induced surface reconstruction. There's lots of literature about it. So these step formations are oxygen induced reconstruction or even a thin layer of copper oxide. 
And we did cross-section cuts through our graphene and looked at these cross-sections in the TM and we could indeed see that below the graphene layers, there's a thin layer of copper oxide forming during cooling. Okay, so that basically explains this, this step formation and everything and the hill and valley formation sublimation. So, and it also shows how important it is to follow the whole process because you learn about graphene growth, how it works, and you also learn about what happens after growth when you cool down. And this, this gives you some ideas about how to control the atmosphere during cooling and how fast you should maybe cool and so on. Let me, let me say a, a few more things about the scanning electron microscope. So I was at the beginning not believing that it would be possible to see a monolayer of carbon at the 1000 degree hot surface with secondary electrons. But we were able to de detect it by, by contrast and we later confirmed its graphene. But it's even more crazy. When you take out the sample after growth and you leave it outside in a room in ambient conditions, and then you put it back to the microscope, we saw that the graphene islands on some grains basically lose, lose the dark contrast. They even look a bit brighter than the copper. And on some other grains, they were still quite dark. This is, this is like before the contrast of graphene was just some kind of gray level. And after exposing to air and leaving them for a few days and putting them back in the microscope, we saw that on some grains, the graphene was still like darkish and on some other grains, it didn't have so much contrast. For example, here, there's a grain boundary, the graphene islands everywhere. And here you can see them as dark islands and on left and right, you don't even detect it. And we were surprised about that. At the same time, a colleague of us was doing XPS and he measured the position of the carbon KH in XPS of samples that he had lying on his desk and he measured a certain position. And then he heated it up in vacuum and he saw that the carbon 1S feature shifts to another point. And then he re-exposed it to air and it shifted back. So he understood that the graphene can be coupled to the copper or it can decouple due to intercalation of oxygen. And actually we could confirm that that is exactly why we see this change in contrast. When we heated up this sample inside the vacuum, at a certain temperature at around six, 700 degrees, chuk, it coupled again and the contrast changed. So not only is the secondary electron signal sensitive to single layer coverages, we can even from the contrast say something about the coupling state of graphene. And those of you who listened to my presentation, I think it's the day after tomorrow, I will, I will show that we're even more surface sensitive. We can study chemical reactions and stuff inside the SC. Anyway, so we can, we can see graphene at 1000 degrees and we can even judge the coupling state of graphene versus the substrate. So it's quite, quite amazing. Good, so the copper story is a quite long story. We did, we did several things on it and, and we have published some of it and not all sadly because they're yeah, slow in publishing. But let me, let, me, let me show you a bit the graphene growth on platinum. I like that much more because platinum is a very good catalyst. And let's just go through it. So it's the same thing. We have this furnace, but this time just platinum. And we start in the same way. So the first thing, let me just slow down a bit. The first thing is we have to anneal and clean the surface. So what you see here on the right side, and I think this is interesting just for people who do material science, you know, it's just, if you want, not, a, not only if you want to grow graphene and so on, it's just to look at how does a, a metal behave when you kneel it. This is just, I, I, I like this video a lot. So the first thing when you heat up is that you see that the surface cleans up and there's a, this foil was lying around. It's a high purity foil, but you know, there's always some stuff on the surface and you, you, we heat it up in hydrogen. We see that the surface cleans up and you see actually very soon that there's also some like grains that are growing. Yeah, you see the, how the surface cleans up and you see then this, some grains grow, some others uh, disappear. So the order changes in the surface. It's abnormal grain growth. And, and so we, we, we can nice clean. So at the end of the video, it's about 900 degrees. Usually we, we, we annealed really to 1000 degrees. And meanwhile, when we want, want to do nice growth experiments, we just anneal forever in 1000 degrees. So this is the annealing. Just from annealing, I think you can learn a lot. And, and my, my PhD student at that time, he, was, he, he, he could really find recipes to grow grains nearly as large as he wanted because he understood how hydrogen influences grain growth and he can play with the atmosphere a bit and so on. So there's a lot, of, lot, a lot to learn. I know. So after annealing, of course, we go to growth conditions. And that's the next video, if everything works here. Yeah. 
So this is now zooming in into one grain. So that's why you don't see these different grain boundaries. It's just higher magnification. It's a homogeneous contrast from one grain. Uh, we are at, uh, at the, the temperature is not seen, but we're at 900 degrees C. And what we now introduce is again ethylene with a lot of hydrogen. So that it's 1.4 to 100. So 1.4% of ethylene in hydrogen. And I will run the video again with my slider. Um, Whoop, this is very fast. So, so it, 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 it's just like it takes a few seconds after introducing the ethylene, and then uh, you see already the, some islands there. It's, it's very simple, it's similar to the, to the case before. It's a darker contrast, that's, that's graphene. And if you don't believe me that this is graphene, just watch the video. So, these islands grow and grow and grow and grow. And then at one point, they cover the whole surface. Now, this is the good thing about platinum. Platinum is a very, very good catalyst. It is easily decomposing to hydrocarbon. So there is no big issue when, when, when the catalyst is covered, it can still grow. And actually at some places, and I indicate this with markers here, you see that the second gray level is coming up. It's just a bit darker than the first gray level. And I claim that this is here where the green arrow is, this bilayer graphene. And at the red arrow, you see actually like a staircase of darker and darker and darker gray levels. That's a multilayer graphene. So it's, it's beautiful. What you can see here is you can see how islands coalesce into a single layer. And you can see how add layers are forming, sometimes in a complex shape, sometimes like a beautiful, like it looks like a spiral growth of, of multilayer graphene. And so, and, and, and it's again, for me, it was very, very crazy. So at 1000 degrees and looking at in a scanning electron microscope, where secondary electrons are detected, uh, we see the different contrast levels. So this is already the first level of graphene here. And then, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now up here is a bit difficult, but we can detect really several layers of graphene. So it's, it, I, I thought this is, this is quite fantastic. And then I have a good tool to, to yeah. To, to do growth experiment and, and, and study all this. Now we'll just quickly go through that. But let me first prove that we really had graphene. So we, we, we took it off, took it into a microscope. This is not extremely high resolution. It's just a picture like zoomed out a bit that you can see that we had large areas without too much, you know, more of a stuff and dirt and things. This is just as transferred and washed and it's actually a large area quite clean. And the graphene quality, according to Raman, was really, really good. And now, the advantage of real time and in situ. The thing is, you can watch while it happens. And you do this in a microscope where you are actually the boss. So that means you control the temperature, you control the gases, everything in real time. So let's just show you one simple example on how that looks like. So you, for example, we start to grow. It's a polycrystalline foil. Me, at that time, I didn't really know what's going on, but, but now you see that there's already something happening in the contrast just before the graphene starts growing. I see there's some kind of like a wave, there's something happening on the surface. And poop, some grains already form triangular or slightly distorted graphene islands. Other grains not yet. And then a bit later, other grains start, and then you have this growth. And then you can, you, can, you can control everything in real time. You think, yeah, that's nice, but actually I have too many nucleation events. I, I just want to change conditions such that I don't have so many nucleation events. So what we do is we switch off the hydrocarbon, we etch everything away. And then we change the growth conditions slightly. So we grow with much less acetylene. And this happens now. And now you see there's only one nucleation event here. No more, just one. So as soon as we see nucleation, we even further reduce the acetylene to restrict everything to this single nucleation event. And then, yeah, we look a bit, we look a bit. We can look at higher magnification, how the growth is. It's a bit strange. It's very, very faceted here. And anyway, then we increase the acetylene pressure. And immediately, let me see when we do that. Here, immediately you form new nucleation events. So you can, in real time, by etching and growing, you can in real time, so, so, so exactly at this point, we switched again to etching, so we etch it away. So, and then another, another attempt. So th that is the beautiful thing, you know, you see and you observe while it happens and you can control growth, etching, ratios, temperature in real time. So I think it's a very fast way to learn. Now, let me, let me show what, what I have started in the previous slide. It was a polycrystalline foil. And now let's go, go a bit more in detail. You see again, several grains. And as we start growing here, I, I have the slider below, so I go back and forth. I hope you can follow me. And 
You see, and one grain, there are graphene islands, very clear dark islands growing. And also a bit on the next screen. I'll let the video run. And then there's nothing happening. The others are not doing anything. Now we increase the hydrocarbon, and then at, as soon as we increase the ethylene concentration. The next, yes? Is there a question? No, what's with the sound? I know. So you see that depending on the ethylene partial pressure, we can actually stepwise start with the most active grains. There's a bit of spillover. So there's also, this is for catalysis, quite interesting how the growth spills over. And I mean, I don't know how much time we have, but, but it's quite nice if you look at this boundary. It actually grows until that grain, but it retracts because here etching is stronger than growth. And as soon as we have more ethylene, growth also happens, it stretches over and it grows here. So we can really, really, really study which surface of platinum is how active. And we did electron backscatter diffraction to really index the orientation of the different grains. So this is a 110 grain, quite active. And of course, you can map all the orientations and, and then you can study why do different grains behave differently. So one is the surface arrangement of F atoms and the catalytic activity that is associated to that. And the other thing is like, how easy is it to grow? Because when we look at higher magnification, we can do AFM and so on. And we see when we have many, many, many steps, even if it's a good surface, but if you have many, many steps, it's a bit difficult to grow. Like you see these islands, they actually grow along the terraces. They don't want to grow against the terraces. We get lots of such uh, elongated sheets. In a flat, in a very flat grain, you, you get different nicer growth and this is a 100 orientation this is a cl close to a 111 orientation so basically if you study the orientation and the topology of a surface you can learn quite a lot about the grain growth this is stuff that we have not even published yet and, and i don't know if we will ever because we have i don't know just too much data i'm afraid so if you're still with me i would uh you have to stop me because i don't you know i don't feel the time uh, anyway, so, so the next thing we wanted to know is how, how is actually when you form multi layers of graphene, how, how is it happening? So in some, in some cases, you have a first layer of graphene on the catalyst. And then the next layer grows because there's like this lifts up and new carbon comes from underneath. For example, in nickel, carbon can segregate from the bulk when you cool down and you form one layer and then the next comes out. And so you have actually such what is called inverse wedding cake. You form new layers always below the first layer close to the catalyst. And the other thing is that, that maybe you grow graphene and the next layer forms on top and again on top and then again on top. And the question was like, how do these guys grow when they're not at the catalytically active surface? And, and, and on platinum, does it grow like these new layers on top or, or does it grow like these like new layers underneath? And the cool thing is we can just look at it. Um, because, uh, yeah, so first of all, yeah, that was our question. So how do add layers grow? And we, we observe different cases. So one thing is that graphene, Add layers can form when, when, when two islands hit each other, grow together, and somehow one bit comes up to the next layer and continues growing. Or you can have a case where you make a screw dislocation. And then you form like a screw dislocation growth of many layers. And you can also have a nucleation at the step where you just nucleate simultaneously several layers because you have a several atom high step. But then the first one is directly under support, gets better food, carbon species grows faster than the other guys on top. They are behind the growth front of the first one and carbon species have to jump up and attach. So they are actually, they're staying hungry. They don't grow as fast as the bottom one. I know. So let, let's go quickly through that. So, so we looked at the growth of multi-layers and here's, here's a video. It's actually, uh, you see we were growing very, very fast. So uh, sorry, very, very slow. This, this, this little flake, just about a few microns large, took two hours to grow. But we did this very carefully. So we balanced the growth and etching with a lot of hydrogen so that the growth is slow. And we, we looked at the evolution of these this, this different layers. And, and the, the beautiful thing is it, it's basically, you can easily model how graphene grows. You have zigzag edges where graphene is attaching, but the zigzag edges are very, very stable. So they're growing relatively slow. Then you have other directions that are growing faster. So you can actually model the growth quite nicely. I will show that a bit later. And we just looked at the evolution. We see again that the, 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 the bottom layer, it's just carbon attachment. So that basically it's a constant radial speed. And then the area, of course, goes like R, pi r squared, goes like a square function as the first layer. So we could model that it's all fine. But uh, 
when we looked at the add layers, so the darker guys here that also grow, we realized, uh, just in a bit more detail, this is, this is this video, and we looked at the evolution of the first layer with time. So, so this is, the, this is the, the flake, right? And here I just look at the time axis. So I flipped it, so cut through the time, and I flip in one direction, flip to the other side, how this growth happens. So this is the growth pyramid, basically, with time. And we looked at the evolution of the first layer, it's the light gray level, the second layer is a dark gray, and the third level. You can actually see this in contrast. And one grows linear, the other is actually not perfectly linear. And we have plotted that here. So the first one grows linear, that's the error, grows as a square function. The second one, you can hardly see it, but that's already a sigmoidal curve. It grows at the beginning faster, and then, because the bottom layer has already stretched out so far because it grows fast, the carbon species have to hop on that and attach here. And, and the, the far, further away the growth front of the f first layer is, the, 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 the less food the second layer gets. And so, on. so you see sigmoidal growth of the second layer. So we already saw that the second layer grows at a different speed than the first layer. Now this could still mean that the second layer is underneath and maybe carbon species have to diffuse in, it's difficult. So it's not yet clear which is on the surface and which is on top. Here's another example. So we see that the, the first layer is actually, I do it maybe a bit faster. The first layer, just look at it, the first layer is still growing. And at one point, the add layer just suddenly disappears. It's very funny. So I can keep the first layer growing if I balance the ethylene to hydrogen ratio such that the first layer still gets food and growth, but growth species that have to hop on on the first layer or creep underneath to continue feeding the other layer is just not efficient, so the other layers go away. And actually, by etching with hydrogen, we could really figure out that the add layers are not underneath, but they're on top. And we studied all this growth behavior of the, of the add layers versus the bottom layers under different conditions. And we, we found really clearly that we have a wedding cake. So the first layer is on the, on the substrate, the second layer is on top. Um, so we did then systematic studies on the etching behavior. So when we start here, we have a first layer graphene, and it's all in the same on the same sample, in the same atmosphere, all the same, just a large image, we cut out different re regions. Here we have the etching in hydrogen of a single layer, and here we have a uh, single layer, a second and third layer, and we look at the etching speed. We did it very carefully. I mean, my, my student at that time was just extremely peaky, analyzing each single frame, and he could plot the etching speed. And the first one, the first layer is directly attached to the platinum, Etch is relatively slow because of a strong coupling. It is really attached to the platinum. It is happy on the platinum. Etching is difficult, so it etches relatively slow. But because the first layer is so happy with platinum, the second layer is very loosely hanging there and is actually etching extremely fast, even faster than the third layer. So that we, we really could, could detect the layer-dependent etching speed and we could simulate the, 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 from the growth, we knew how, grow, how fast different edges are growing. And then we could also simulate the shape evolution based on the, on, on the findings. And then we could just reverse the growth to etching, use the same uh, kinematic wolf construction, and then simulate etching. And the etching is actually very, these are simulations on the bottom, and this is what really was observed. So there's no magic in it. It's just how graphene grows and how graphene edges. You have stable edges growing slowly and you have fast growing edges. When you reverse the fast edges, they, they edge faster. So we could, we could simulate it and all the kinetics are basically quite well understood. I don't want to go into the details. It's all published. But the, 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 what I want to give you here as a message is you can learn so much by just looking and by systematically changing growth and etching conditions. Yeah? So in the end, we could confirm the different ways to form add layer graphene. Add layers grow on top under our growing growth conditions on top of the first layer. The second layer is relatively instable. Edge is very easy because the first layer is so happy with the platinum, the second is a bit left alone and so on and so on. And, and we also could confirm that. So the first layer, when we did STM, we saw that there is no edge state. So the first layer, the, 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 the graphene atoms are really interacting very strongly with the substrate. And the add layer that it sits on top, the graphene edges are basically probably hydrogen terminated. There's some, some different electron density here. I know, so we started that indeed. And then we, we found that actually graphene on platinum, as soon as you cover the catalyst, 
the whole cattle. So you need really to cover everything. The add layers, they don't get any food anymore. It depends always a bit on how much hydrogen you have, how much growth uh, species you have. But we observe that we, when you keep the sample long enough and the full single layer film is already there, closing, encapsulating the catalyst, then with time, all the add layers, so there's a single layer, this, this gray contrast is a single layer, and we were then able to remove by just by etching all the add layers and the end up with the single layer graphene over the whole catalyst. So it's quite nice. So we have found a, a, a growth regime in which graphene is self-limited to the monolayer. Yeah? So we saw how the growth behavior is, and as soon as the catalyst is completely coated, and we have a hot, a cold wall. So there are no chemical species generated in the wall of the oven because our microscope has cold walls and they're far away. So only the catalyst counts. As soon as the catalyst is covered, all add layers have to go because we have still high temperature and we have still hydrogen, but no more growth species. Yeah? So we found a regime in which we can systematically grow monolayer graphene. Uh, this is basically here. And the beautiful thing is, this is, this is quite amazing. Um, uh, this, this is like just after growth, the platinum is not yet completely covered. You see these bright areas? They're still unexposed platinum. It's very active in here still uh, from, from the earlier stages. You still have these multi layers, all of them there. But as soon as the platinum is completely covered and you just wait and wait and wait, as I showed in the previous video, all the add layers are disappearing because of constant hydrogen that is still there etching. The bottom layer actually heals, defects are also etching, but it immediately grows again because it's on the catalyst. So while the bottom layer heals, the add layers go away. And this region here, after some time, is fully uh, monolayer only. All the add layers are gone. And this, this window here is, if you compare it, it's exactly this grain, it's this grain. So the, you see this is after a while, it's all a single layer. So we want this nice window to, to really systematically grow monolayer graphene. And then, of course, we wanted to know when we have all these islands growing together into a single sheet, do we have grain boundaries or is this all a single crystal? Because you want, in the end, you want to have a monolayer single crystalline graphene. So you need to understand how is the coalescence behavior of different grains. And so we do the growth and we see in this video, it's very, very slow running, but you see how, how islands are growing together. What you also see, by the way, is Add layers, the second guys, they are etched. Yeah? As soon as the, as the growth front is too far away, they are, they are starving, they are too hungry. I mean, they, they, they don't get food, they're just getting hydrogen etched away. These guys up here, and that one is already gone. And, the, the, and this happens while the first layer is still growing. But of course, we have the microscope. We can study how the coalescence happens if it really gives rise to a monolayer film or if there are still grain boundaries. For example, here at this. And this edge, they grow together. Maybe there's a grain boundary where my mouse is, is just pointing here. Yeah, so what we do is we just go to etching. And this is, this is such a grain boundary. And we, we switch to hydrogen etching. As soon as we hydrogen etch, we see that there are little, little defects opening up and we're etching little holes. And this is, these holes are all aligned at the grain boundary. Grain boundary is not perfect, right? And, and then when you go to hydrogen etching, everywhere where you have a defect, you etch a hole. So we can nicely see here was a grain boundary yeah, when these two guys were merging. So we, we looked a bit into more details. What are the conditions for a coalescence that leads to a grain boundary free merging? And, and I will show this in the next video. So this is, this is basically that island. So you see there are several islands. They start like this and they are merging. Yeah, there's a coalescence behavior. And in the video, I will show you in the, in the next slide, you will see how these islands are growing together in more detail. And I just would like that you look a bit at the angles between, we call it concave edges. So they have a, yeah, that there's a two, two, two inverts pointing growth fronts like here. They're growing together. And what you will see is that these concave edges here or also here, they are merging. And there's something happening when they are well aligned. So let, this is the video. And you see there's a concave edge, it whoop, close, close. There's concave edge and whoop, it, it fills up. So it started laid back with a concave edge and it filled up very fast. I do it again, because I would like that you know what I mean. So for example, these two guys, they will soon touch. It happens basically around now. And as soon as they touch, this negative angle here fills up extremely fast. Just look at how fast this corner grows versus that 
concave edge. And you see the concave edge grows and fills up like nothing. Same happens here. These two concave, as these two zigzag edges, of course, the graphene growth is terminated by zigzag edges. So I know this is a zigzag graphene edge, and this is also a zigzag graphene edge. Now let's see what happens when they touch. As soon as they come together, whoop, it fills up like, and, and it forms a new angle. This is a zigzag edge. I don't know if you can see that. This is a zigzag edge, and there's a slight different angle. You need to look very close. So I was very grateful to Chushun Wang. I just credit to you, Chushun. Uh, he did this analysis. I don't know. He just immediately saw there's a different angle. Yeah, and, and, and it fills up like nothing. And then, of course, we I mean, don't have atomic resolution in the plane. We see atomic layer coverage, atomic layer sensitivity in coverage, but laterally we don't see atomic resolution. But, but when you look at this video 100,000 times, then you realize there must be something going on like this. So you have one grain with a zigzag edge, you have another grain with a zigzag edge, and you grow. To grow, you need to always create a new kink and fill, and then make a new kink and fill. But if you attach carbon right in here, in this hexagon, it's very easy. Energetically, the best place to put a carbon atom. And when you put a carbon atom, oops, sorry. When you put a carbon atom right into this corner, you have on the left and the right side, again, a nice place to put a carbon atom. So you put the next two things here. And when you continue doing that, you end up with an with a edge that is the fastest growing high kink density. We call it the 19 degree edge. As soon as you form this edge here, you grow, this is the fastest growing edge. You know, zigzag edges, they are very stable. They don't grow fast. These are the red guys here. And the green guys, they are the fast growing edges. They, whoop, they fill up that whole space. So we did DFT simulations and it really confirmed this filling at the concave edge. So this is the experiment. It's exactly the video of before, just color coded with time what happens. Yeah? The video I've seen before, here's the, the stack of frames, color coded. You start with a concave angle of 120 degrees. And then you form here, this 19 degree edge, and also here, the 90 degree edge compared to the 120D, so, yeah. And then this grows up very fast. So this is experiment, and here's simulation. We did the simulation for the typical cases that can happen. You can have a wide open concave angle, you can have a narrow concave angle. And so, yeah, everything is, is, is beautiful. You know, you see something, and even if you don't have the atomic resolution, but the time is your friend, the, the temporal evolution, tells you what's going on the atomic level. And then, now I stop here, because I, I think my time is nearly over. Uh, we did this also for other catalysts, in this case for ruthenium. Now ruthenium is very strongly coupling to the graphene. The problem is they have different lattices. So you get a more pattern. And, and this is a bit complicated, but you have different points where you can put the carbon atom of the hexagon structure with respect to the to the FCC positions of the ruthenium. And actually you have to look at the topmost and the, 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 the actually of the three topmost layers because you have hollow sites where you can put the carbon atoms, you have bridge sites and so on. And there's different coupling strengths. And in the end, you end up not like atomically attaching atoms, but really you always attach a Moray unit, a Moray unit one after the other. It's a bit more complicated. But so we studied all this in detail by, I, I think this was also done by Chushun. He really combined STM and C2STM and all these kinds of things to, to really understand how you can make from individual islands a continuous uh, seamless coalescence monolayer film. So with this, I want to thank, uh, this is just my, my standard thank you, because I thank always all my colleagues, but all his work was basically done by Chushun. I'm just presenting it. Yeah, Chushun is now, Sadly, he, I mean, sadly for him, gratefully, he got a position at Shanghai Tech. Uh, yeah, so, but, but he did all these in situ SM studies. So I hope I didn't bore you. Um, please, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. As I said before, you're, it's always a pleasure to have you present here because we always learn something. And actually this time we, you've outdone yourself. I, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. So, um, it's now we have the floor open for questions. Has anybody got a question for Mark? You can just speak because otherwise it gets very complicated. Just speak if you have a question. I okay. Have, I, have, I have a question. Yeah, yes. thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, general, but I think uh, it is related to you. Uh, you are a uh, uh, separate situation, graphene and uh, graphite. 
In your experiment, did you uh, determine this is control or any, any your comments? So, this? so that is also the question. Like, can you say something is few layer graphene or is this already graphite, right? Yes. So monolayer graphene is graphene, clear. And we see when we have a monolayer graphene on platinum, the second layer behaves different to the third layer when we compare the etching behavior. The second layer feels that the first layer likes platinum so much that the second layer is already instable. And the third layer maybe behaves already more like graphite, I don't know. But I think you can still talk about few layer graphene as long as you don't have the properties of graphite, right? As, as long as you get modulation of the properties for each additional layer, you get a different material, then I would say it's few layer graphene. But as soon as any additional layer doesn't change anymore the physical chemical properties, then now you're in the graphite regime. But that's, that's like my interpretation. Okay, thank you. Any more questions from Mark? Please ask questions, otherwise I don't know if you even listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, should, I should ask the question. Then. No, you, I, I know that you are. Uh, <laughs> I do actually have a question. So okay. uh, Mark, uh, you said that um, in the first part that the, the graphene is growing on a molten copper surface. I mean, I, I, I don't work with graphene. I know, the only things I know is what Paola tells me. But I mean, um, it obviously makes the question, are um, there works in the literature where people have tried to grow graphene on an alloy surface? For example, if you had silver and copper, not only would you change the melting temperature to lower the melting temperature, but you would also change the oxygen affinity. And then you would change this whole part of the recrystallization part that you Absolutely, were yes, yes. So my question is that, basically. No, I mean, it's very important. At a certain temperature, copper is liquid, and we all agree, then you grow in liquid copper. Below that, you have grain-dependent onset of surface melting. The 111 starts to surface melt later than others. Then the partial pressure at which you grow, we grow at low pressure. I guess sublimation effects and sublimation is atoms leaving the surface. All these things also contribute to surface mobility. So if you grow at higher pressures, maybe the onset of the surface dynamic and melting is also different. And as you said, if you alloy, you know, people who grow with copper nickel alloys or whatever, then you can stabilize the surface. And there are lots of papers where people have grown under growth conditions where they very clearly see grain dependent growth behavior on copper or, you know, I think that is really very critically depending on the temperature and pressure that, at which you grow. So yes, so, so this surface pre-melting, we would, it would be great to look into this in more details, um, but we didn't. So we just had our high vacuum SCM growth conditions. And we did growth on copper nickel alloys. We have one paper published on that. And, and there we also had still reconstructions due to oxygen. So it would be very nice to study with some UHP people to, to precisely dose how much oxygen do you really need to grow? Is it really true that you cannot grow without any oxygen at all? Does anyone ever even have no oxygen at all? I don't know, because there's always copper, there's always a bit of oxygen. So it's a complicated thing. This, the topic is not closed, of course. So you can study for another 10, 15, 20, whatever years. But I mean, I would love to, to, to do that, you know? But I just don't have the main power, I'm afraid. Excellent. Um, any any other questions for Mark? Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. yes. There's some echo. May I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, what about the time resolution? Because there are many processes which maybe are too fast or maybe too slow to study with electron microscope. Yeah, so, so we were always growing under conditions where etching and growth are, are very, very strongly competing. So the growth was relatively slow. If you grow on platinum, you can grow extremely fast if you just reduce the, the hydrogen concentration. And our microscope depends a bit on the, on the resolution, how many pixels you scan versus the scanning electron microscope. When we just scan a small area, we can, we can take a very small area, we can take hundreds of frames per second, but then you really have very noisy images that are pretty bad, but you can still see something going on. But so it depends on the resolution that you want and on the image quality that you want. But if you, as I said, if you scan a small area and you scan very fast, you can do hundreds of frames per second. But at such a resolution, it's difficult to really say something. Okay. This might improve in future a bit, but uh, that is a limit, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Any more questions? 
in that case, obviously, thank you very much, Mark. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank everyone for listening, Duncan and uh, Igor and everyone for organizing. And I hope to see you soon in Aveiro sometime. <laughs> Us too. Okay. <laughs> see you. Thank see you. you. Um, we ha now have a coffee break and we are back at um, quarter to 11. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye.